uh, I'm not quite ready to speak about uh, machine learning proper, even though this is uh, the subject of our uh, Bakatech co collaboration. There are interesting developments. Uh, they introduced uh, uh, in an informal meeting today about uh, the use of uh, machine learning representations and neural networks uh, in adaptive observers. Uh, I am, I've chosen for today a topic that is, that is more solid, uh, more mature, a topic related to my long-term interest in extremum seeking. There is a connection. There, these are two distinct forms of learning. The distinction is that uh, machine learning conventionally attempts to uh, learn a map, whereas extremum seeking aims at learning only the optimizer of a, of a map, map that is at least uh, locally convex. And this is what makes extremum seeking usable uh, in real time applications uh, for uh, dynamical systems, which has been my, my occupation the last couple of decades. Um, uh, as you can see, the title contains some user unsignable uh, final uh, finite time. So this re relates to recent efforts in this field of extremum seeking to advance from uh, exponential convergence rates, provable exponential uh, stability properties and convergence rates to uh, arbitrarily short user assignable in spite of uncertainties, uh, finite times of uh, convergence. And I will speak about two results. The first is a result uh, that applies to uh, a class of nonlinear ODs modeling mobile robots which is the work of Velimir Todorovsky, who purely coincidentally is, is, um, the, uh, is a graduate of FAU Erlangen uh, and whose work on his master's thesis, uh, um, he, uh, uh, I supervised and he recently defended at the Technical University of Munich. Uh, the other result will be uh, the result of my current PhD student, originally from Turkey, Turul Yilmaz, on uh, uh, extreme seeking control under delays and for partial differential equations. So, on with this presentation. So, I will first give an introduction to extreme seeking and then uh, go through the uh, elements of this talk. Uh, a prescribed time version of extreme seeking. A prescribed time version of extreme seeking applied to mobile robot for, uh, for finding a, a source uh, of a signal uh, without the um, uh, position awareness. Prescribed time extreme seeking under input delays or measurement delays. And finally, prescribed time extreme seeking under PDEs. So let me now introduce extreme seeking. Uh, it's an invention that took place exactly 100 years ago in 1922. And I will tell you who invented it, but let me just, just tell you what the algorithm does. So the algorithm deals with a, a possibly a static operating map or a dynamical systems whose equilibrium map uh, has at least a local extremum. And the problem is that the map is unknown and the goal is to maximize the output of that unknown map by finding the value of the input, namely by finding the optimizer that uh, gets the map to operate at its peak level. This invention a hundred years ago can be boiled down to this feedback law. This feedback law includes only one state, which is the state of the estimate of the optimizer, the output of this integrator. The engineers can think of it in terms of the Laplace transform one over S. That's the, the core of the uh, compensator. In addition to it, there's a time varying component of this feedback law. And this time varying component is uh, a perturbation of a sinusoidal in time form, which is injected additively at the input of the map and which is applied multiplicatively to the measurement of the map. We call that the demodulation. The result of these, these operations, after applying some averaging calculations, is that the input into the integrator is actually an approximation of the derivative with respect to the argument or the gradient in the uh, multivariable case. 
So that's the basic idea of extremum seeking. How about the invention? Was it invented in that way? And when, and by whom? So first, the, the when. This invention was reported uh, in an August issue of uh, this journal uh, after a presentation of this invention to the uh, French Academy of Sciences uh, about a month and a half earlier in July uh, 1922. What did this algorithm look like? Well, this is what was actually invented. Back then, those, those kind of block diagrams of feedback systems weren't around yet. Uh, you can stare at this and it's hard to tell what it is. It happens to be a quite brilliant electromechanical device that performs what's in that block diagram. It consists of an air core transformer capacitor pair uh, whose inductance is uh, valued by varying the air gap. Uh, many of you are mathematicians, but those of you who are electrical engineers, I would say that this, this uh, circuit has a level of complexity that, that would be appropriate for a fairly hard exam at a second year circuit theory course. It's, it's quite clever, original, nonlinear, time varying. Uh, so that's the invention. Who, invent, who made this invention? The man's name is Maurice Leblanc, French inventor and industrialist. Those words we usually associate with Edison, Robert Bosch of around the same era, Nikola Tesla and so on. So he was a contemporary of those people and operated across the range of physics, some math, engineering and business. Uh, what else did he invent? Uh, this invention is related to his, uh, to, to his efforts in electric railways or trams, trolleys, and so on. But he actually invented the, the abstract notions, all of the elements of the television systems. That's, that's his invention, as well as some other uh, things in refrigeration and so on. There's a famous prize that the French Academy of Sciences uh, gives, and you will see here at the bottom, all the mostly mathematicians and, and some mechanicists, physicists, uh, such as Boussinesque, uh, Boussinesque Darbo, Cartan, uh, Fréché, Fréton, Goursa. Uh, this is small font, so I'm reading it so I uh, make sure everybody got it. Adama, Laguerre, uh, 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 and so on and so forth. Point carré. Um, so uh, this, this man's inventions were respected enough to, to put him. Uh, in the company uh, of these uh, recipients of this uh, prize. Extreme seeking was uh, of interest to control people uh, in the uh, 1940s, primarily in the Soviet Union. Uh, there was some interest in, in the early 50s in the US by, um, uh, uh, by uh, Charles Stark uh, Draper and others. And it kind of disappeared in the uh, 1960s. Uh, I came across it and uh, I was unsettled that there was an algorithm that works uh, like a miracle that is in the domain in which my early research was essentially adaptive and nonlinear control, but that whose uh, workings were actually not even fully explained, let alone uh, its stability and convergence being proved. So uh, I worked on it. And once, once the question of stability and convergence of this algorithm was settled, totally unex unexpectedly for me, the interest uh, kind of exploded. I thought it was, it was, it was good to settle, settle an open problem, but uh, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the rate of activities in both applications and in theory that, that followed uh, was not something I uh, an, uh, anticipated. And right now, uh, one, one can count probably 2,000 papers uh, per year um, related to the subject of extremum seeking, national equilibrium, uh, uh, national equilibrium seeking, source seeking, uh, stochastic extreme seeking, and related problems. Uh, where is the most... Uh, significant industrial application of extreme seeking before I get uh, turned from 
uh, from all this to, uh, to some mathematical problems. Uh, the most impactful application was in 2013 in the area of semiconductor manufacturing and specifically in the area of the development of light sources for photolithography uh, in semiconductor manufacturing. So let me remind you of Moore's law, the prediction about the increase of the density of microchips. Uh, this Moore's law was uh, being followed and delivered on for several decades until finally physics said, okay, you've reached the limit. Um, you can no longer produce light of, a, of ever diminishing wavelength, but at a sufficient um, uh, power so that you can carve silicon for the sake of semiconductor manufacturing. So to um, remove that obstacle, the physics had to be changed. So instead of lasers, a new amazing invention was, was created where uh, the property of the phase change of a particular metal, tin, between its liquid state and its gaseous or uh, plasma state was exploited for producing high power, but low wavelength uh, light that can um, be used for, uh, to uh, perform lithography in silicon. How is this done? This diagram explains how this is done. Uh, the liquid tin, droplets are generated by a droplet generator, which I mark here by these red dots. So there's a train of droplets of liquid metal, uh, which is so rapid, 50 kilohertz, that, that you can't even hear it. That's how rapid it is. What is the task? The task is to hit each one of these drop, droplets of liquid metal uh, with a laser pulse again, 50,000 times per second. And in fact, twice, twice as many because you need to hit it twice. First you slap it into a pancake and then you blast it uh, into, into a plasma. Uh, so you need to hit the bullseye uh, 100,000 times per second using a laser. Uh, you need to aim the laser. How do you aim the laser? Using uh, a, a mirror and a lens which are actuated with a separate motor and a piezo. And this is where extreme of seeking comes into play. Extreme of seeking uh, is optimizing these two inputs to maximize the intensity of light emitted by, uh, uh, by this equipment. So once this problem was solved, uh, the, um, increase, the, the decrease of the wavelength was by a factor of about close to 15. And the increase in the density, in the area density of chips was by, by a factor of about 200 or more. And in fact, that was in 2013, but last year, last May, IBM demonstrated uh, 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 manufacturing of chips with a two nanometer. So going from uh, over 200 nanometers to 13, to 14 nanometers to two nanometer uh, chips. And this technology is now used by all of the, uh, the um, uh, semiconductor man manufacturers, IBM, Intel, Samsung, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing uh, Corporation. So let me now, uh, now move on uh, beyond there. Uh, by the way, let me just, just wrap up this introduction by saying that my interest has, has been continuous over the last 20 years, even though I thought it would be short lived in 2003, I thought I was done with it. And we published a, a book summarizing many, many um, theoretical and applied uh, uses of extremum seeking and I meant to left it, but uh, extreme seeking didn't leave me. So uh, uh, constantly new problems come up. A, sto a stochastic version was in introduced along with the um, new averaging theory to, to enable its stability analysis in 2012 with, uh, with a postdoc Shujun Liu. And uh, the newest um, 
uh, major effort uh, that that took took us the last six to seven years. Tiago Ru Oliveira, who is here um, in the seminar, uh, is is about to come out uh, by the end of the year as a as a new book on uh, extreme seeking in the presence of delays and PDs. So let me now uh, briefly remind you of the diagram from here. This is a diagram that ensures exponential convergence of this estimate theta to the peak or to the very, very near vicinity of the peak of this map. The objective is to go from, from an exponential rate to finite time convergence. So uh, to introduce the, the prescribed time version of extreme seeking, I just need to introduce a, um, a couple of in basic ingredients. One basic ingredient is this function, which is essentially of the form one over time, and it blows up at the terminal time, T naught, the initial time, plus the interval denoted by capital T. So it's a function that, that sort of hyperbolically blows up at the terminal time by which we the user demands uh, the reaching of the extreme. By the way, you can note that this function is actually a solution of a nonlinear differential equation, of a Riccati equation, which happens to blow up in finite time. This is, this is useful to know that, that, uh, that this function is actually uh, a state of a dynamical system. So the modification of the diagram that I showed you before uh, is fairly minor. Uh, this blow up function is employed as a gain and it is also employed in changing the frequency, in accelerating the oscillating frequency of uh, the additive perturbation and the multiplicative perturbation. Specifically, this is how this blow up function is used to modify uh, the perturbation signals. There is a name for sign of, uh, a, uh, of, of, of a function of time uh, that uh, grows more rapidly than, than, um, than linear. This is called among engineers and particularly among uh, communication uh, people, a chirp sig signal. So it's, it's a sound that grows in frequency and that's, that's why it's referred to as, as a chirp. It sounds like a chirp of a bird. So we, we employ these chirp sinusoidal per perturbations. And what happens before I get into any theorems, let's, let's see you know, if we get what we want. We do. The objective of this algorithm, the user, the user's demand of this algorithm is for the convergence to be completed by 40 time units, 40 seconds. And you see that this is achieved by accelerating the rate, uh, the, uh, accelerating the, the frequency of this chirp signal. So that is the simulation. That is also what I want to formally state mathematically and prove. So how is that done? So the mathematical statement is the following. For a statement to be made, we need to introduce two time scales, which are not linearly related. The natural time is T, which evolves on a finite interval up to the terminal time capital T. A transformed or um, dilated time all the way to infinity is this time tau. So this is t divided by, by a linear function in t. And, and the inverse of that transformation is given here. This is a contraction of time from the infinite uh, time for the variable tau to the finite time for the variable t. So now that we understand these two uh, uh, um, uh, time variables, the result can be stated. The result states that for sufficiently large um, nominal frequency omega, 
there exists in the time tau, namely in the dilated, elongated time, a unique expo locally exponentially stable periodic solution of period two pi over omega, which satisfies the property that for all time, for all dilated time is small, namely of the order of one over omega where omega is large. So this is in plain engineering words. It means that uh, the solutions are attracted to a, to a periodic oscillation whose amplitude is very, very small. In other words, we get to the peak and we fluctuate minimally around the peak. Uh, uh, the additional statement, the main statement, the, the practically useful statement is made back in the original time T, in the contracted time T. This is a statement that says that as the time approaches the terminal time from below a course, the difference between the actual output and the maximal possible output as well as the, the, uh, the square of the difference between the uh, input and the optimizer value of the input is small. Namely, it's proportional to one over omega squared plus uh, the square of the small amplitude of the um, perturbation to uh, theta. So that is the first introductory result on prescribed time, uh, extreme of seeking with a single input and no dynamics, just for a static map. Let me now talk about prescribed time source seeking, namely seeking for a class of nonlinear systems that model uh, mobile robots operating in environments where they are unaware of their positions. This is uh, the master's thesis work of uh, Velimir Todorovsky from Skopje, Mas uh, Macedonia, uh, done uh, as uh, as a thesis for TU Munich after his undergraduate uh, work at FAU Erlangen here. So first of all, what is source seeking? Source seeking is a problem in which a vehicle uh, operates in a GPS denied environment. It has no awareness of its position, but there is a signal uh, that the vehicle can, can measure. And the signal can be a sound, an electromagnetic signal, a chemical agent, a smell in particular, um, the intensity of light, you could be seeking light or you could, you could be seeking dark uh, in a GPS uh, denied environment. That is what source seeking is. And the really interest in that subject is that it has to be done in the presence of uh, a dynamical model or rather a set of dynamical equations that model at least the kinematics, if not also uh, both the kinematics and the dynamics of a um, um, mobile robot. Uh, what um, Velimir worked on was that problem, uh, but with an additional challenge of uh, augmenting the standard non-holonomic kinematic model of a vehicle, which is given by, by the first two lines without the stuff in red, augmenting it by this uh, component in red, which is a destabilizing term, which models a potential repulsive character of the source. What does that physically, what might that physically mean? It means that the source of a signal might, for example, be at the top of a hill. So you have to overcome, uh, so you have to not only be attracted to the source, but you have to overcome the repulsive nature of, uh, of gravity on your way to uh, getting to the source. What is the algorithm? The algorithm for uh, prescribed time source seeking is given here. Uh, and this algorithm is, uh, pretty minimal modification of an earlier algorithm uh, by, um, uh, by um, a student of mine, Alex Schenker, uh, a visiting student from the University of Stuttgart, Hans uh, Bandur, uh, and, and me. 
uh, the modification consists in uh, replacing a constant gain in the feedback of a washout filtered measurement of the output, replacing a constant feedback by this time varying uh, gain that, um, uh, that increases over time. So that is the algorithm. The modification is, min is, is minimal. I'm sorry, the, the forward velocity is, is also increasing. The modification of the algorithm is minimal. It's, it's the study, the, um, it's the theory, namely the study uh, of this closed loop system that is the interesting part here. So how is that done? The first st step in the study is taking the model along with the algorithm and applying the time dilation transformation where uh, the finite time operating vehicle is converted into a model uh, that is studied on an infinite time horizon. You will see that the destabilizing repulsive term is now multiplied by essentially a one over, over tau squared uh, time varying coefficient. So as time progresses, as the real time approaches the terminal time, capital T, the repulsive force will matter less and less under that feedback. To complete the analysis, one applies averaging theory uh, to the system in the dilated time tau, obtains exponential convergence, and then uh, inverts the time from the dilated into the contracted time t and goes from exponentially decaying in time to decaying in time at a rate of t times mu of t, namely decaying to, to, to zero by the terminal time capital T. A comparison in the simulations between the exponential source seeker and this accelerated prescribed time source seeker are shown in here. Uh, the trajectory, uh, the, the, the two trajectories in um, orange or ochre or yellow and the one in purple are over the same time interval. It's just that the prescribed time uh, seeker gets much further and gets all the way to the source while uh, the exponential seeker is only you know, making its way towards uh, the source by the terminal time. Let me now switch to infinite dimensional versions of this prescribed time extreme seeking. This is the work uh, by uh, my current PhD student, Turul Yilmaz, with whose undergraduate degree is at the University of Bozici in Istanbul. So uh, the algorithm, the, the, uh, I will talk about two problems. First, compensation of a delay and then a compensation of a parabolic PD, namely a heat equation and the actuation uh, pathway uh, before the map. So I will focus your attention with the use of color in this block diagram. The objective is to maximize the output of a static map which is here denoted by Q, the map. Uh, the challenge to achieving this objective is the presence of a, of a delay, which I represent here in engineering frequency domain, Laplace domain notation as e to the minus ds. The means to achieve prescribed time convergence is the use of uh, of the of the blowing up gain nu uh, as given here, but there is a delay to be compensated. The uh, uh, the increasing um, gain was the feature of already the delay free algorithm. It's it's the delay that I want to focus on now. So how is a delay compensated? The delay is compensated using the so-called predictor feedback uh, or backstepping feedback applied to the transport PD representation of the delay line. Uh, 
And this predictor feedback compensates the delay by employing the delay state for feedback as shown in this little diagram. Don't try to fully understand this. This is not something that, that can be understood at a glance. One has to do, do some, some calculation to see how the compensation is achieved. All right. So that what I'm showing you without, without the increasing new is the work, is the algorithm of um, Tiago Oliveira from several years ago when, when, uh, when he was staying at UCSD. One has to also account for the presence of the uh, delay uh, by um, modifying the perturbation signal. This perturbation signal is what I show here in blue. And the perturbation signal adapted for the situation where there is both a delay and where the objective for uh, convergence is not exponential, but prescribed time convergence is given here. So there are two things that, that you should notice, or three things. First, there is advancing in time, not so important. More importantly, there is chirping of this cosine. And thirdly, there is, uh, there is a growth of the amplitude of this perturbation that you see in here. Finally, Tiago's algorithm requires that an estimation, not just Tiago's algorithm, the use of uh, the presence of a delay and the consequent requirement for the use of predictor feedback, uh, which is model-based, requires that the Hessian of the unknown map Q be known or be estimated. It is the est it's estimation that we pursue and we're pursued by the injection multiplicative uh, uh, demodulation using the signal N. This signal N is given here. What's important is actually, I should, I should move this arrow. Not only that, that the, the, the frequency grows at the rate of mu, but that this is twice the frequency, that's the important thing for, uh, for the estimation of the Hessian. So in summary, this is the algorithm. Uh, the state space representation, the simple single equation representation of, the, of this algorithm is given here. And uh, the gist of all that is done here is to um, perform the cancellation of a delayed term in the estimate of the gradient using a delayed term uh, introduced through predictor feedback. That's the simple version of the story. Before I get to a theorem, let me show you how this works. That's, that, that, uh, it's, it's worth uh, pursuing theorems because this uh, is, is practically um, uh, doing what it's what what it was meant to uh, do. So, in the absence of the compensation of a delay, this, the 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 algorithm simply simply fails. As the when the delay is comp compensated with the predictor, and when the prescribed time modification to the gain and to the frequencies is introduced, you see a successful uh, completion of the convergence by the time 45. Uh, the interval over which the prescribed time convergence is desired is 40, but there's a delay of five seconds, which also uh, um, needs to uh, take, uh, take place. So the convergence uh, takes place in a time interval, which is equal to the sum of the delay D and of the time horizon capital T, which in this simulation is 40 plus five. All right, so now the theorem. Uh, this theorem is much, much more complex because uh, even the averaging theory for, for such infinite dimensional nonlinear systems uh, was not available. We had to develop it from, from scratch. So what does the theorem says, say? Consider the terminal time capital T and a time capital T bar, which is arbitrarily close to that terminal time, but not equal. 
as close to the terminal time, but, but not the same. Then there exists a sufficiently large frequency of this oscillation omega star, which depends on capital T bar and grows without bound if you really, really want to take T bar uh, to capital T, which is not, not permitted. So if your algorithm employs any frequency larger than this lower bound omega star, then what is guaranteed is that the um, norm of the error signals, and the error signals are the um, estimation error, as well as the state of the delay, namely of the transport PDE, which is uh, expressed in, uh, in the L2 norm, uh, decays down to O of one over omega. In other words, it becomes arbitrarily small. Uh, this is just a notational reminder that on the previous page, this var theta symbol is the difference between the delayed estimate and the unknown optimizer. Additionally, what happens with the output is that the output uh, converges to the um, unknown maximum of the output modulo uh, an O of S squared plus one over omega squared error. How is this studied? What is the analysis? After sifting the literature and a number of averaging theories for systems on Banach spaces being almost applicable, but not really. There's, as you know, there's no almost in mathematics. <laughs> it became clear that we had to do this, this from scratch, develop what's needed from scratch. So here's how it goes. Here's how the averaging for, for, for this class of systems that have a gain that grows without a uh, uniform bound, here's how it goes. The system which consists of, of an OD state for the estimate theta hat, as well as the infinite dimensional st state for the delay is imagined in this evolution, written in this evolution equation form, which is a nonlinear time varying uh, system. Mu additionally is treated as a part of the state as opposed to being uh, um, a time dependent coefficient. Averaging is introduced with this expression. So this is averaging with respect to the explicit time variable in here over a window that grows as omega goes to infinity, but it's averaged. This is a mean over that, that window. So this is the notion of an average. Now, a departure from the standard Krilov, Bogolyubov, and other conventional forms of averaging in going here to the infinite dimension is that we consider averaging in a weak sense. So we now step from the evolution equation into this weak formulation, weak description uh, of, of the system from the pre previous page. You see that I have, um, I have taken this equation and then I have added and subtracted this J average and multiplied it with a test function and uh, integrated it. And that's the uh, weak formulation. The key step in the proof is producing an estimate of this integral, which is O of one over omega. It is O of one over omega because it, it's, it, it, one can through calculations show that it ends up being as a, a, a product of one over omega times, uh, times a much smaller than omega function delta of capital uh, T times the, uh, the norm of the test function. So at the end of the day, on that finite time interval, arbitrarily close to the terminal time, but not all the way to the terminal time, the average state approximates the actual state with an error no greater than one over omega. So back to, back to why we're doing this, let's remind ourselves that it's because this, this work that we're doing this and, uh, and let's now move on from this, namely from a delay 
to something hairier than that. And that's now going from a simple transport PD to the heat equation, which is enormously more challenging as it, as, as it turns out. So first of all, what is the uh, system that we're dealing with? Where does the heat equation appear? The heat equation appears at the input into a simple integrator, a single state uh, OD for this capital theta. So the algorithm is being applied at the boundary X equals D, whereas the Neumann quantity at the boundary X equals zero enters this integrator. How did we think up a structure like this? Well, the Stefan model of the phase change gives rise to that structure, except that in the Stefan model, actually the boundary is moving. In other words, this, the, the, the value of the boundary depends on theta itself, but that's yet another level of difficulty and we're not there yet. So, so this is the problem we're dealing with. Uh, applying an input at one boundary of a, of, a, of a heat equation, the other boundary of the heat equation driving an integrator and the, the state of that integrator entering an unknown map and us wanting to maximize the output of that unknown map. The first thing that needs to be uh, determined here is the perturbation signal. In classical extreme of seeking, the perturbation is sine of omega t. In prescribed on extreme seeking, uh, the perturbation is sine of omega t times mu. But in this problem, we need to solve a motion planning problem for the heat equation to have the right kind of a, um, uh, of, of a perturbation signal. So we need to solve the motion planning problem given this output at the boundary x equal to zero and seeking the unknown input function s of t comma n of t. And the solution to that motion planning problem is given explicitly by this infinite series uh, in which there's no time to get into all of the details, but the interesting part is that in addition to being uh, infinite, this series employs Laguerre polynomials um, for, for, for this uh, uh, in the solution, this uh, motion planning problem. Then with the open loop part solved, namely the perturbation signal determined, we go into the feedback part, namely compensating uh, in a feedback manner, the fact that we have a heat equation in the input path to the static map. And the solution it, it would take much longer to motivate this. So I, I have to simply state things that take a very, very long time to think up. Uh, I, can, I can just state, uh, state this control law and this control law has three components. So this feedback has, has components denoted here by Q, P and R. All of these components, uh, which follow the rationale of PD backstepping. All of these components have certain gain or kernel functions that need to be determined. And they're denoted here by QC, gamma C, and QR. Each one is sought in a different manner and I'm going to show you how. But here, before I move on, this is the feedback flaw. Um, we're applying theta hat dot as an input uh, or we're driving theta hat um, uh, through an integrator uh, with theta head dot. And the input consists of some feedback of the heat equation state minus the solution to the uh, motion planning problem for the heat equation here, as well as here. And, and also a component related to the estimate of the gradient. Okay, so as I said, there are three kernels. The function gamma C, the function, I'm sorry, QC, gamma C, and QR. Let me start from QR, the one at the bottom. That one's the most, the closest to the, what's been seen before 
in PD backstepping. So a PD, so this this kernel is governed by the PD given here. This is a time varying PD without the variation of time. If this were not here, it would be a hyperbolic PD in X and Y. But with the presence of time, this is what we get. There is the uh, the gain um, mu squared appearing in here, and this PD being of the Gorsa form, namely being on a triangular domain, actually happens to be explicitly solvable. This, it, it doesn't arise in any previous application uh, prior to, to, um, to backstepping control. So this kind of a, a, a solution is something that you see only in that context. It's been seen in that context be, uh, before without, um, without the dependence on mu. And this is this is uh, how uh, it comes out uh, when one introduces the damping mu squared uh, into the problem. I one is uh, is a Bessel function. What interests us on the theoretical side is a growth bound of this of this uh, kind of a function, and this this function is shown to be. Uh, uh, to have an exponential bound in the function mu, which grows itself. The second uh, uh, function is gamma c. It is governed by this PD, and its explicit solution is given by this expression here, which again contains Laguerre polynomials, and which we bound by this exponential expression in mu. And the third function, the third kernel, QC, is governed by this PD, uh, which cannot be solved explicitly because it has this input of the boundary condition. But it, it being of a Gursa form, it can be converted into a Volterra equation with two integrals uh, uh, using a su successive approximation approach and uh, with that approach, one can get an estimate on this QC, which is again exponentially mu. In all of these exponentials of mu, the coefficients are different. So finally, uh, how does this work? It works as shown here. The uh, heat equation is compensated. And I'm showing here a wide range of per performance behaviors because the map is unknown. You never know how much gain you should take. And I'm just showing you that if you're lucky, you're gonna get convergence at this rate. But if you're really, really unlucky, you're still going to make it to the extremum in prescribed time. What is the theoretical result here? So now that we have gone from a transport PD, namely a delay to a heat equation, uh, the theoretical result involves uh, a norm of the state that incorporates also the, the first derivative, namely an H1 norm of the uh, distributed state. And the rest of it is as, what, what you, as, as uh, you have seen before, namely the output uh, gets uh, arbitrarily close to, to the optim, uh, optimal value, the maximal value Y star by the prescribed time. How is this theorem proven? So far, it was so complicated, but that was just the design. I haven't even started the proof. So the proof has three steps, and I have really only three, three more slides. Uh, the first step is performing averaging. I've already shown it to you for the uh, delay system, so I won't be showing it to you again. This is what one gets for the average system. The second step is employing the backstepping transformation to the average system not to the actual system, which was a part of the design. Uh, I just want to point out and give credit that this particular approach is partly inspired uh, by a similar approach that Jean-Michel Coron and uh, some collaborators of him used um, as, um, as a PD backstepping approach to proving null controllability of the heat equation in time t. This was a, the first result that I know of where null controllability is proven not by an open loop function of time, but by a feedback. 
And there, there, there's included a stepwise rising mu as opposed to a continuous, uh, cont continuously uh, rising or blowing up mu. This backstepping has uh, a, a long history fr from uh, finite dimensional systems to uh, adaptive control PDs, to adaptive control delay systems and so on. Um, finally, the last slide is the study of the stability of that target system from uh, two slides back, this, this target system, which is a PD ODE system. The stability of that PD ODE system is conducted using a Lyapunov function that incorporates the H1 norm and, and the square of the uh, ODE state. Uh, after some calculations, there is one term where there's a potential positive, um, um, uh, uh, a potentially a sign, uh, sign being, being wrong, and this, this is being overcome uh, by uh, certain choices of the, um, of, the, uh, of the gains. And at the end, one gets uh, prescribed time convergence of the average system state by uh, the time capital T. So just to remind ourselves, this is why, why we do this. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tool for uh, real-time um, optimization based on learning only the optimizer. So with that, I apologize for taking the extra time. Let's, let's chalk it up to the 